Well, hello and uh, welcome to everyone. I'm so excited to welcome members of the Macaulay family. We have uh, people uh, who are participating from all eight campuses. And believe it or not, we have alumni from every single class from 05 to 23, with the exception of 06, 07, and 10. Only three, three missing. So um, this really is a community event. And um, I'm so happy that uh, we have in our Macaulay community experts we can uh, call upon to explain uh, coronavirus. And um, uh, so let me uh, quickly um, introduce them. Uh, on our website, there were extensive bios. So I'm just going to quickly um, introduce them and then start right in on the discussion. Um, Dr. Marion Howie is a member of Macaulay's Parents Council. That's her most important role, I think. Uh, but in her spare time, she leads the emergency medicine residency program at uh, Long Island Jewish and, and Northwell Hospital. Um, Tanya Miketic is uh, a Macaulay Honors Senior studying biomedical engineering at the City College of New York. Um, and we have um, Dr. Sachin, Sachin Shah is a medical doctor, an anesthesiologist, and a graduate of Macaulay at Queens College. And Stephen Phillips um, is a global health and pandemic preparedness practitioner, just as with um, Marianne and Sachin. Um, he's a physician. He also has a master's degree in public health. And um, he's a member of the Macaulay Honors College Foundation Board. Um, so uh, the pandemic is the, um, it has uh, basically taken uh, center stage in um, almost every aspect of our lives. In the United States, there are over 1.2 million cases, over 71,000 deaths globally. We can look at 3.5 million as the number of cases to date and over 250,000 deaths. Um, it's not hitting every uh, country evenly, and um, the United States has become a hotspot um, for the virus with uh, what appears to be two very different strains on the East and West Coast, with the Eastern strain being uh, more infectious and, and taking over. Um, I'd like to start the question um, with um, a question for uh, Dr. Steve Phillips. Um, about the overall picture in the United States of where we're heading. Um, he recently wrote an op-ed um, entitled, What Are Your Worst Fears, Lockdown or Open the Economy? Um, and um, he, in that essay, he called on us to uh, deploy science-based realism uh, in uh, solving this question or addressing it. Um, so I would just like to ask, how does science-based realism, how can that be deployed to improve our country's response? Um, what does it mean to attack the virus on its terms rather than our terms? Right, uh, Mary, first of all, uh, thank you for assembling us. It's such a great panel and uh, so much foresight, I think, on your part to put, pull us together. And, you know, I think the Macaulay community has heard the term existential threat as applied to any number of things, uh, climate change, especially recently, but we never thought we would be in the middle of one so quickly. So I think it's incredibly timing, timely and relevant um, to address this as part of the community. So, um, you know, that this COVID virus uh, in, uh, is now spread to 187 countries and is still spreading as we speak. And um, as we look at the daily crush of news, we see how countries are responding and how they're doing. And then in the US, we see a lot about how our 50 states are responding. And I think what's lost to many is um, Mr. Darwin's prophetic research, which is that, you know, we have a virus that uh, is uh, entirely ignorant of um, the human condition. All it sees in us is really a host and a vector in terms of uh, population biology and evolutionary biology. And I think the more 
we as a country, we as a global community can put ourselves into the virus's point of view, which is, you know, all of the uh, uh, dimensions we've heard about. Uh, what's its uh, latency? What's its reproductive index? Uh, how long uh, can it be shed? Uh, what, what is the infectious uh, fatality rate? W once these numbers come out, they actually play across populations. Um, and let me just focus it down on New York a little bit. Um, it's interesting that in our country that has 50 states, and each state, as we have now seen, is conducting its own natural experiment. And uh, along scientific lines, I think New York City has distinguished itself uh, in ways we may not recognize, which is not only are we the unfortunate epicenter in terms of toll, in terms of cases, hospitalizations, fatalities, but we're also the epicenter in terms of the statistical information that not only the city will need, but I think the country will need to logically address lockdown and open up uh, scenarios. So let me just say, hot off the press, I just looked up today's New York City cases, hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and we've gone uh, in one month from April 7th to yesterday from 6,000 cases to 604 cases. Uh, hospitalizations, uh, new hospitalizations, 15, 12 to 12. And deaths from 577 a month ago to 47 yesterday. And uh, you know, this has been accomplished through uh, everything that we have uh, seen and done over the last month. But you know, the open question is what are the criteria for reopening and not only reopening, but what are the specific kinds of interventions that can be eased up versus those that have to be maintained very rigorously. And so what uh, some governors are saying, including ours, is it's gonna be driven by data, data, data. And every time I hear that versus ideology, 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 I, I'm very happy because the more we amass data and analyze it seriously, I think the more pragmatic and effective our policies can be. So let me, let me just stop there, but I think it's very important that we do recognize the virus on its terms and try to minimize the various human projections that we tend to put on it. Well, that's a great spot to end because with data, 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 because uh, our own Tanya lives in the world of data, data, data. And, and I would um, just ask you, um, what is precision medicine? And um, what are the mobile friendly tools and the uh, AI voice assi assistant uh, skills that um, you're marshalling to detect impending uh, COVID-19 hotspots? And are you moving from New York uh, to the rest of the country? Is your, um, is your, ver is your aim to do this globally? Um, tell us a little about how you are marshalling data to fight the COVID-19 virus. Right, so uh, to start, precision medicine is medical care designed to optimize efficiency of both treatment and prevention of diseases. So um, the Englander Institute of Precision Medicine is the translational research hub where we use these tools, such as in our case, clinical data to improve patient health care. So um, as we just mentioned, there are many dashboards that exist which are tracking the amount of COVID-19 cases and deaths on a global le what level, whether it's um, the New York Times, the CDC, or the World Health Organization's website. But what our research group is aiming to do is we're developing a daily survey tool that relies on people self-reporting their symptoms, risk factors, and demographics in order for us to try to identify areas of outbreak before they occur. Um, in order to anticipate the needs of the healthcare system. 
So the idea there is to identify if there's a surge of COVID-19 related symptoms in a particular area so that our communities can be better prepared for an outbreak with proper supplies, essentially to get ahead of the coronavirus by getting resources to the right place. And um, currently, yeah, we are trying to make it on a across the country type of scale, mm -hmm. not just in New York. Well, we do have um, two physicians who are on the front lines of the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic as it, as it manifested in, in New York. And now uh, they are uh, riding the, the, the flattening of the curve. But I would just like to hear from, from both of you uh, what, it, what it was like. I mean, for you personally, professionally, um, you saw what was happening in Italy. Um, we could see that um, this was coming our way. And uh, how could you, um, how it, I, I just like you to describe what your personal experience was. Um, either one of you can, can start, uh, Marianne or, or Sachin. Erin, you can go. I think you're muted, Marianne. Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the things about emergency medicine is we live at the front door of the hospital. So we end up being the entrance for anything that's coming in, uh, you know, from MERS, SARS, and then uh, Ebola. Um, and now, now this. Um, you know, when we were prepping for Ebola uh, years ago, it was a very focused concern. One physician was going to go into the room uh, they were going to be totally covered with PPE because, of course, this was a fatal disease and um, there were all these fears and anxieties attached to that. Well, this has blown that out of the water because essentially what's going on is that people are spending, depending on their location, their entire day just in PPE. Um, you know, where where I am in, in my particular emergency department, um, we are in mask all day. We're in head coverings all day. Um, we aren't in gowns all day because we use gowns going into different patients' rooms. Um, but in many places, people are gowned up for the entire day. Just even the particulars of how do you recognize the people you work with is a challenge. Because everybody looks very much the same inside of one of the blue PPE gowns. Um, I think what's super fascinating to me is, is the energy and novelty that, you know, we bring to medicine and the element of trying to care for people in a really horrible, frightening situation. One example is people came up with the idea of getting pictures of themselves and putting them like taping them on the outside of their gown. Some people use pictures of themselves. Some use pictures of uh, rather good looking actors and models, uh, I think to lighten the mood because, you know, this was tough. This was you, you go to work and you in one way or the other are putting those you meet with on the other side of this in some sort of increased risk. Um, but the team of medicine working together really is amazing because you end up, uh, a lot of people right now are struggling because they maybe don't feel their purpose. And I'm quite sure um, that I speak for the clinical physicians who are working um, and finding work right now is we absolutely feel our purpose. And we have a team of people we feel that purpose with. Mm -hmm. Now, you're um, an associate program director for um, uh, the uh, emergency medicine residency. So, so you're really trying to support people on, on the front lines. and. Um, how has your approach to your work changed in, in, uh, in the context of the pandemic and how will it change in the future as you sort of consider what emergency medicine is gonna look like from now on? So there's an awful lot of directions to go with with this question. I think the first level of question, how as an educator is education changed, right? Because educating a 75 member residency, always a challenge, becomes even more of a challenge when you're not supposed to meet in groups. We do a Wednesday morning conference. And so we do conference for um, everyone who is available to come and we arrange a schedule. There are 50 people. We obviously can't meet in groups of 50 anymore. Um, and so we've had to translate all of our educational skills to online, just like all other educators in the, in the world are currently doing. So that's one angle. 
The other angle is it's a lot easier to find the person who's maybe not doing so well among the residents if you're in a position where you have 50 people in a room it's easier for that one person to either kind of touch base with the others and try to figure out maybe they're, they're the person who wasn't feeling quite right. Um, and they need a little extra support. So it's been a real outreach, both by um, the program director I'm very lucky to work with, Tom Herrera, and the rest of the team. There are um, about seven of us on the education team, along with the other faculties, um, members in the group. And, and, Again, the good part in what we do is we were able to show up to work every day. And so one way or the other, the other residents were having contact with faculty in one way, shape or form or another. Um, some more than others, some less than others. But we've made efforts also to try to meet with each person individually to make sure that we can touch base with them and make sure that they're doing okay. Um, you know, this is a heck of a time to be an intern in medicine. Being an intern or a resident in medicine is, is always hard. And then just throwing a little dose of pandemic. And um, it's, it's tough. It's a tough choice to make. And it's tough because they have been, excuse me, just doing such exceptional work and exceptional jobs. Um, Are you... Uh have you lost any members of the residency team or any of your healthcare professionals? Um, so we've had people who've been sick, but thankfully no one within the residency has um, truly uh, been in a dangerous position. However, I just came from the St. Barnabas residency and one the surgeon who actually ran the residency program there died. Mm -hmm. um, the One of our nurses lost their, their partner um, uh, and he was a, healthy 50 year old man. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot to be said. I know we're kind of talking a little bit about what the virus does. I actually, from my view, um, given that, and I know that elderly at risk, and I know that there are lots of other different groups that are at risk, but in a way, I feel like we're focusing on the virus. The reality is the vast majority of people who get this virus are either asymptomatic or have minor symptoms. And the people that Dr. Shah is seeing in the ICU and the people who are, you know, overwhelmed by their illness are really reacting to something called cytokine storm, where it's almost their own immunologic response to the virus is, uh, is affecting them in such ways that their organs are non-functional, including the lungs, the kidneys. And we find that, you know, there's a lot of people that are, that are clotting, which is also affecting them in various ways, whether it's stroke heart or lung, uh, and they're developing myocarditis and other inflammatory problems that are really the, the problem that in the long term seems to be much more of the issue. And, and Dr. Shah could speak more to that, I assume. Thanks, Marion. So before I start on that, you know, we were just talking amongst our group uh, over, over the past week, and six, eight weeks ago, no one knew who the individual anesthesiologists were in the hospital. We were someone who came in, put people to sleep, moved on, and uh, you know, the day would go. Um, I've been introduced and started to know more people in the last eight weeks in the hospital setting than I have in, in my entire career, it seems like. Uh, and you know, we've, I've primarily practiced pain management for this last five years. Um, some 10 to 15% of my time was dedicated to anesthesia. And with everything that was going by, everyone was stepping up, whether it was their specialty or not, I felt compelled to help the people in need. Fortunately, I was, I'm in a, in a long-term facility type of hospital where we don't see as many acute patients as Marianne does or some of the other physicians on the front line in, in the city or in Jersey. But when the patients do come to our doorstep, it's usually when they're in pretty bad shape. They're not breathing very well on um, a nasal cannula or oxygen face mask. And initially, the, the first option was to intubate these people, meaning put a breathing tube down to help them, to assist them, uh, assist their respiratory um, organs. That's beginning to change. And um, it's beginning to change for the better, where we have different positions we can put patients in, different tools that we can use to hopefully give the, the patient some uh, benefit uh, utilizing that new technology and also spare them the, the, the intubation. I hadn't mentioned earlier that as the cycle, you know, I think we're up to six, seven weeks now in the metropolitan area, those patients who were initially intubated are now 
that are still uh, that remain on the uh, on the respirators are now up for something called a tracheostomy, which is a more long-term solution for their breathing issues. And that's a whole different kind of worms that uh, that's opened up, whether it's whether it's exposure for more staff, including operating um, surgeon, the circulating nurse, the scrub tech, as well as the anesthesiologist. So things are changing day by day. Um, but the fortunate thing is, we, is, at least in our hospital and in the area that we are uh, practicing, it's starting to change for the better. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one thing I was talking to my wife is I've never been scared to go to work. And uh, during the last few weeks, the minute I get out of my car, it's, oh, man, I have two little girls. And the last thing we need to, is to bring these, you know, uh, diseases home to our, to our families. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent do you worry about children? And initially, everyone was told that this is a virus that kind of passes over children. And now there's a syndrome associated with a coronavirus. Uh, can you talk about that at all? It's... it's the syndrome Kawasaki vasculitis has been out for, yeah, uh, I can't tell you how long, but that, that's been a separate illness for a long time. Um, it, there's, I think, a recent eight-year-old, um, I believe he was eight years old, and his parents found him uh, completely unresponsive. Long story short, they took him to the hospital and found out that he did have Kawasaki's vasculitis, and that was, that's becoming more and more of an issue in the younger and, population, not just the children. And also COVID positive. And also COVID positive, yeah. They've been, um, and I think Marianne can probably address this, uh, young adults, 20s, 30s, that have had strokes that are related to um, uh, the coronavirus and COVID syndrome. Mm -hmm. And essentially, she, sorry. Go ahead. Essentially, one of the things that we found is in the beginning uh, of the illness, and, and again, this truly was one of the beauties of medicine, where you go to work every day and you learn something new every day. The dynamics of how this infection was affecting people was um, such a moving target, and it was such a great sign of team learning in that we would go to work every day and, and there'd be something that the ICU people had figured out that they would share with us or vice versa and we would share with them. And um, it really did, you know, in, in all these towers in medicine, it really did break down towers. And I want to emphasize among the people who were still able to work in medicine, because one of the very odd things about this um, as a physician is realizing there are friends of mine that have gone into other specialties in medicine um, who, who aren't able to work now. There are surgeons because the ORs are closed and there's no elective cases and they are unable to really actually um, do the jobs that they want to do and they, they really want to contribute and help. I think, um, you know, what's happening in terms of Kawasaki disease and the other illnesses is that in the beginning of- Can you of, just describe what Kawasaki disease is to uh, the people who may not have heard of I it? shall try. <laughs> uh, so it's generally a pediatric disease. Um, it is, um, uh, it's an illness of young children and the issue is less the initial inflammation and presentation of the illness because it presents as kind of this viral generalized illness where they have red eyes and a strawberry tongue and these other things. But the issue is that down the line, it can affect the vasculature of the cardiac vessels primarily. And so you have a weakening of a wall of an artery that you need for your heart. And, and that at some point can rupture. So it's really something about just having a super high suspicion that this is something that could be a problem on the other side of it. And of course, now it's linked to um, COVID as an inciting factor as well. I think one of the things that we're finding with COVID in the same way that you know syphilis was the great pretender is that COVID is a trigger, back to what I was saying before. COVID is a trigger so that within the body, there seems to be some immunologic overload in some way, shape, or form in some select people that causes it to just uh, affect a lot of different organs, and then they, they, uh, they demonstrate the illness in very different ways. Mm -hmm. We also had, when we had the first group of people that came in, where it seemed to be primarily a pulmonary problem, we then had a little bit of the curve dropping down. And then we had people come back to the emergency department, because that's actually another thing. You were talking about how emergency medicine, medicine is shifting with this illness, is we had that phase where we were completely overwhelmed with an enormous number of patients. Um, thank God most of them fairly well, but some of them very, very, very ill. Um, you know, at, at 
some point there were 150 intubated patients in my hospital. Um, they opened up essentially corners of the hospital to run ICUs that were not used for that previously at all. Uh, you have these, the, the illness that presents, that group kind of went down a little bit on the arc. And then you had people coming in with normal emergency medicine problems, like I have a kidney stone. And we would do a CAT scan for the kidney stone. And then we found out, oh, and by the way, they also have COVID. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was such an endemic illness in the community at that point that people were coming in with normal problems, but had been infected, which also emphasizes that you have the vast majority of people who are asymptomatic from COVID, and then they can go on and have their normal problems, but by the way, they have this illness. Um, and now we're starting to recognize, I think, a little bit more about the other breadth of problems that are being brought on by how that, that particularly small, sick group reacts to this illness or this virus trigger or whatever it is that it's doing. Mm -hmm. Now, back in, uh, back in 2003, I, I worked in the ecology of infectious disease, how, mm. how diseases move from wildlife to livestock and humans. And the Chinese horseshoe bat um, uh, brought uh, the coronavirus, um, across the SARS virus mm -hmm. uh, to wet markets. It immediately went uh, from China to Canada and, um, it was um, it had uh, it was more lethal than uh, COVID nineteen, um, and then it disappeared. It just no one knows why. And and um you know this is such a strange virus, and it's doing so many things. It's an inciting virus. But um, if we go to Steve's point at the outset of well, let's what what does the virus want to do? Um, what are the chances that that we might see this virus? Um, mutating and, and, um, and no longer being an inciting event. Um, what, what do you see? I mean, it, it just seems to be such a shapeshifter. Do you have any thoughts on that? Steve? Yeah, um, well, first of all, let me just uh, throw in a caveat. I'm, I'm not a virologist or immunologist, but I've been reading avidly. And, um, you know, uh, the virus is uh, mutating as I understand it, and uh, has about a couple dozen known mutations. But I think immunologically, the question is whether some of these mutations, which are point mutations in the RNA, whether they're going to manifest themselves in morphological change on the coding of the virus. Because um, there are a lot of spontaneous mutations that uh, uh, viruses get that are not changing its antigenic uh, characteristics. So what I think the virologists are really tracking, much like they do, by the way, with, with the influenza virus, is whether these mutations change something about the spike protein, which is what you also mentioned, because the spike protein ap appears to be the number one uh, candidate for a successful vaccine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so if the that- virus is very clever and changes, then it raises the question. I think a lot of the people on the call today are wondering, we're hearing that, you know, as Marion said, there seems to be a high seroprevalence. They test a, a lot of people have had very mild or asymptomatic cases and up to uh, I think 20% is what I've heard of seroprevalence in, in the New York area. Um, are we, you know, the, the, the virus mutating and, and, and becoming an innocent bystander is sort of one pipe dream I have. Another is, how can we get to herd immunity, which would be what, 50 to 70% um, exposure? Or would it have to be higher than that so that this virus loses its grip? Right. So the uh, herd immunity is, you know, one of the major concepts for ultimately being the end game. And you can either get that through a vaccine that's effective. Uh, or naturally, in theory. Um, as I understand it, the more communicable a virus is, the higher the number of infected people have to be in the population to establish a, an effective herd immunity that actually stops transmission. So the best guess now for the COVID virus is 
something unfortunately in the order of 70 or 80 percent or possibly even higher uh, because it's a very communicable uh, virus. But um, I was just reading about this explicit policy that's trying to generate a countrywide herd immunity and their state epidemiologist said that uh, right now uh, the uh, level of in, level of uh, infection in Stockholm is about 40 percent and he anticipates that by the end of this year it might be 60 or 70 percent that's Stockholm by the way not all of Sweden but he doesn't anticipate uh, the levels in Stockholm to ever rise to uh, a, a level of immunity that will eliminate the virus. He thinks it'll slow transmission tremendously and the number of cases are gonna drop off and the number of fatalities tremendously, but he does not envision a scenario, even in the country of Sweden and a small, relatively small city of Stockholm that will actually eliminate transmission. Mm -hmm. And if it is mutating, then the question is, is there immunity? Or you get one strain, then you can catch another. Um. You know, it, but I, to me, mutation, uh, you know, virologists uh, are on top of it. So they'll, they'll, they're surveilling uh, for mutations, but it's such a red herring that um, nobody really knows whether, as you implied, the virus could get attenuated through mutations, meaning weaker and weaker, or it could get totally different and perhaps even much more uh, virulent than it is now. But I, it, it's it, one thing is known uh, for a coronavirus, this is not a highly mutating virus relative to, uh, you know, the lexicon of all coronaviruses. So uh, we just have to look at it closely. That's about all you can say. Well, I, I'd like to ask Sachin and, and Marianne as, as practitioners, um, you know, it, it's kind of, it's scary, as Sachin said, and, and the question is if, if we're um, doing these, basically these experiments based on uh, sort of politics of uh, opening and, and, uh, and staying in place, as the economy, you know, the economies are opening, um, are you uh, anticipating uh, surges again? And what are your thoughts about um, whether we should remain in place or have it staged by demographic category? Or um, do you have other thoughts from uh, your perspective of what you think we should be doing um, in our city? From a purely practice and financial standpoint, I would love to get back because 99% of what we do is uh, elective cases. So yeah. by us having stay-at-home order, we're not doing anything unless the patient is in a tremendous amount of pain. Um, so that aspect, yes, I would like to have some normalcy, but in practicality where we've seen states in the South, uh, somewhere in the, some in the Midwest that have started to open up various uh, areas of the economy, you know, within, it usually takes about seven to 14 days, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong Stephen Marion, where we'll see, you know, a spike potentially. In, in the back of my mind, I think that's going to happen um, uh, just because it, it, we don't have anywhere close to the herd immunity numbers. And as people get more and more antsier, they're going to try to go outside. They're going to try to defy those rules. And I don't, I don't, in my opinion, I don't think that's going to fare out very positively for us. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding in, uh, to agree with Sachin as well, um, is that the way that the United States politics approach this, the idea was not to, uh, I can't remember what the right word for it is, but basically blow up the curve. Our, our aim was to flatten the curve. Our aim was to decrease the number of cases at this time so that the hospital systems don't get overwhelmed. It's never been that people won't get sick. It's just to try to stretch out the time period over which they will get sick so that we will have enough uh, ability to care for them medically within the systems that we have present. New Zealand that's not their approach. New Zealand closed the country way earlier in the disease compared to what we did. My daughter, you know, as a, as a caveat, my daughter happens to be in New Zealand right now. And, and as a mom, I'm certainly happy if that's the country she picked to be during her gap year, that's not a bad spot to be. Mm -hmm. um, but, but New Zealand's decision was to try to eliminate 
contact enough so that the disease couldn't even really take off. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be in the, in, in the practice of as we go back to normalcy after this, is that something they're going to be able to maintain? I'm not sure, but, but the implications here were never that we were going to stop the disease from happening. We were just going to allow that 80% of the people who are going to get the disease, because this is an incredibly infectious virus, to have it stretch out over months instead of a two-week period. So I think that, you know, there's a balance in all health issues and medical issues and social determinants of health are also incredibly important. And if you have people, you know, again, I'm lucky. I have a job. I'm getting paid. But there's a lot of people out there who aren't. And I got to say, I think at some point that balance becomes incredibly important. Now there's risks and benefits to everything. And unfortunately, the risk is that as there is more contact, there are going to clearly be more people who are sick. And unfortunately, there will be more people who die. That is absolutely true. And it's something that I think we as a nation have to understand that when those decisions are made, that decision is not made without implications. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think- On either side. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, I guess New Zealand is, is sort of holding out, hoping to be in splendid isolation until a vaccine is available. And I just like to ask about uh, your thoughts on uh, whether, I mean, it's not a guarantee that we'll have a vaccine, but there, I don't think there's ever been a greater effort. I, I was listening to Larry Summers talk about opening the economy and uh, he, was, he made the point that since we're already losing $500 billion a week on the, the closure of the economy, we should be spending $10 billion on, um, on, uh, on basically on treatments and on um, vaccine um, research. Um, uh, because it's no time to uh, to try to economize on that. Um, what what are your thoughts on uh, on the likelihood of a vaccine coming anytime soon? We hear a year, two years, eighteen months. Maybe it can't happen at all. I don't is it, know. Is this is this for oh? This is for anyone who can answer okay. it. Okay. Well, so you know, uh, would be uh, curious about everybody's views, but uh, just reading some of the science and knowing some of the scientists involved in passing, I don't think there's ever been a higher level global biologic R&D effort that has been marshaled so quickly. So uh, in general, most of the barriers to collaborative science and the pace with which new science and innovation develops have been blasted through. So the levels of funding, the levels of uh, international laboratories involved, the amount of collaboration, the amount of sharing of intellectual property rights, the amount of and the ease of publishing, uh, including preprints, including uh, Zoom meetings. Um, so that's really encouraging. And then the other thing that that I think is encouraging, not because I'm a vaccinologist is, um, but uh, appreciating the role of serendipity in science. Most of the great innovations we know about, you know, the X-ray, uh, penicillin, uh, are creations of serendipity. And um, I think it's heartening to see that there are something like 80 to 100 different vaccine development ventures going on. And not only are they uh, different, but they represent fundamentally totally different categorical approaches in terms of the underlying uh, technology. So I'm pretty persuaded that um, uh, human ingenuity will win out, but uh, in terms of the probability and the timing, it's um, not, not known. But the, let me link one thing uh, to your question, Mary, that I think is critical that some people may not fully understand, which is that there, there is no successful vaccine to any vaccine preventable illness where humanity doesn't make spontaneous antibodies and, and becomes immune to it. So the vaccines that we have developed all basically supercharge the 
immune system. natural immune system. So that these questions now about does the COVID virus cause immunity, it's not an academic question uh, because we, we fervently hope that it does and, and most coronavirologists think that it will at least short term and possibly longer term. But if, if there is not natural, effective natural immunity, the likelihood of a vaccine goes uh, catastrophically down. Yeah. Uh, I think another, I'm so sorry, another important vaccine related um, connection is um, realizing again and looking at the, at the schema of public health in the country, unfortunately at this point people are um, hesitant to go to their doctor's office or they have been hesitant. A lot of um, pediatricians office for instance are, are empty and, and so other vaccine controllable illnesses are actually, uh, the, the people are falling way, be way behind on their vaccination routine for children. And that, in terms of thinking about second waves, I think, true, one of the things about thinking about is whether or not there's a second wave of COVID in and of itself. But I think we're going to also find on the other side of this, there are the other illnesses and other problems that were not appropriately suppressed during the time that we are so involved with COVID. And that's something I think as a, as a health system in general across the country is something we really need to talk about and consider. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Um, uh, at this point, um, I, there are so many uh, questions that have uh, come in. I, I'd, I'd like to, to share some of them, um, uh, and some of them have to do with uh, uh, immediate uh, concerns. Um, for Marianne, here's a question. A Macaulay graduate working as a resident in a New York City hospital has parents at home with a combination of diabetes, HTN, and asthma. He fears infecting them, especially since one can be an asymptomatic carrier. Do we know if COVID is transmitted by breathing alone? So um, COVID is passed on through fomites. Um, they have um, material that's coughed out or breathed out that can land in uh, basically in dust, right? It becomes dust in the area and that can be uh, a mechanism of transmitting the infection. And I think part of the issue that the, the um, questioner had is absolutely rampant on like the front line of research and emergency medicine at times, which is Facebook. And all of the Facebook groups that, that are particular to my profession, and there's little groups that I'm part of, um, the real questions in the beginning of this was how do I not give this to my family? And the fear that's attached to that. In my house, for the first month when I was coming home after a shift, I, I was, um, you know, taking off all of my hospital clothes, they were going away, I was getting in the shower, I was sleeping in a separate room from my husband, um, because that fear of contamination is very real. I have colleagues that didn't see their children for a month, that they lived in a separate place from their young children and their spouses. Um, it's, it's a real fear. It's not small. It's mm -hmm. not small. Now, are you all um, being tested for antibodies and is that providing any kind of um, sense of uh, reassurance? Um, one of the questions that just came in, um, it was addressed to Stephen, but I think anyone uh, could address it. There's been an emphasis placed on antibody testing, but these tests in their current form aren't reliable. Why is there still such a push for antibody testing currently? And are there any speculations for when a reliable test may become available? So I can, I can, uh, Marianne or, or Sachin, do you want to take it or? Uh... I just, I don't want to take the whole question. I did just get antibody tested and I was okay. tested negative, which I find so hard to believe. Uh, so I'd like to believe that it's not accurate, but I'm afraid that it's probably more accurate than I want to give it credit for. In my opinion, we, we have, they just started offering antibody testing in the hospital this week. I haven't gotten it yet. But my worry is if you have the IgM, IgG antibodies, will your guard be lower when you're working? And uh, that's the worst thing. And I, I'm guilty of it too. And I was, we, we were talking amongst our group, you know, do we not wear the mask every time? Now we're very vigilant about it, washing your hands. You know, I'm sure everyone's hands are dry and cracked just like everybody else's, but what is that going to solve? Uh, and uh, that's, that's my question. I'm, and obviously there's no answer to it. So the, uh, my concept is that the, uh, FDA has pretty much thrown up their arms about validating 
antibody tests. Uh, there was a rigorous procedure prior to COVID, but now there are uh, dozens and dozens of available antibody tests. And uh, I would just be really careful about which one uh, is administered in that they, they all have uh, ratings around sensitivity and specificity. The ratings right now are by the manufacturers themselves and uh, only a handful, I think, have been validated by the FDA. So uh, if possible, I would get an FDA approved antibody test. Um, and I think they're gonna be vital ultimately both for uh, individual clinical management and also for an understanding of the population epidemiology of how widely the uh, virus is spread. So uh, again, I would, I, I'm advising my love. That until they can be sure. They approved. And also that there's a tremendous amount uh, driving toward quality antibody tests right now. So I would, be, I would be surprised if there weren't a bunch of quality commercially available tests in the next few weeks, let's just say. One of, oh, did I? Um, one of the things that um, uh, I, I think concerns everyone is in the absence of antibody tests, I mean, Governors can open their states, but people are going to vote with their feet whether they're going to go back to businesses and schools. And we have a question uh, from a Macaulay parent who runs a special education centers for young children. And um, this uh, parent anticipates that both families and employees will be reluctant to return. Um, when do you think child care centers will be able to be open? Will they be able to return to normal? Do you think that a second or third wave will shut them down again? Can we even answer those questions with the information we have now? Steve, do you want to try? Yeah, well, so let me just say it's, it's not only a great question. I mean, just multiply that by some order of magnitude. I think, I think all of us uh, have concerns about under what conditions and circumstances and jobs do we return to when the economy opens up? And let me give you a generic answer because uh, uh, each specific question is very fraught. It's, it's much more than just a public health question. But to me, until there's data-driven answers to individual risk by job, by setting and by age and that's fully possible you know if if we i think if you are between 21 and 30 years old and are a school teacher in an elementary school you should have some idea a good idea of what your risk profile is in terms of your likelihood of in any given geography likelihood of being infected and then likelihood of being hospitalized and mortality um, if, if you are infected. And by the way, that data now, New York City and New York State are, are the leaders in the US. There, there's increasingly good age-specific data, sex-specific data, race-specific data. And then also um, ultimately, you know, covering elementary schools, secondary schools, daycare centers, uh, care homes, all that is achievable. And my own sense is people are gonna be reluctant to make um, abstract decisions until they have something to look at that really speaks to them in terms of their own risk pro profile. And then society and government is not gonna make that decision for most people. The people are gonna make that decision for themselves. Well, I think uh, this leads to a question for Tanya that comes from our, our viewers because um, the question is, are people willing to include their medical information and symptoms on the mobile app for EIPM? Because after all, um, you know, everyone's interested in seeing what the data are, but often are not willing to contribute to the data set themselves. So how, what is your success rate there? Right. So our, um, we are very aware of these concerns. So 
we haven't actually had any problems with that because we have placed an emphasis that we do not store people's personal data and that we track areas and not people. So on our, for example, on our survey, we only ask the first three digits of someone's zip code and not their specific area code for th that privacy concern. And um, we only have like one option at the end of the survey after you complete it, if you would like to have cookies on your computer so that you don't have to keep filling out the same response for things that stay the same, such as your zip code and your age. But um, so far the survey is deployed and it is, the web app is live. We have about 6,000 surveys completed so far just from word of mouth. And we have spoken with the governor's office about implementing the survey on their government websites in order to have a wider outreach. But with this early data, we can't yet predict these outbreaks. Um, but what we have found, some, um, some interesting things that we found is out of those 6,000 people, over 80% are um, in self-quarantine and 15% are instituting some level of social distancing. Um, but yeah, I've, I can speak more about how the survey has also, um, a similar survey has shown success in Israel where the scientists at um, the Wiseman Institute of Science they have accurately predicted surges in cases like Jerusalem and Beersheba five days in advance. Um, but that being said, our biggest issue is outreach. And I will be putting the URL of our survey in the chat so hopefully our audience can use it. That's great. Um, but we are also talking to Carnegie Mellon and we're, we're it's about um, collaborating with them because um, they are also collaborating with Facebook with a, um, a similar survey because it also um, reports on symptoms but it's a little bit different because users get selected on Facebook to take the survey, but so far they have 1.5 million data points. So they're going to need um, help with um, analyzing their data, which we're, we're hoping to help them out with. Um, yeah. And that's, that's fascinating. And it, it speaks to a whole new way of uh, practicing medicine. And um, actually that there's a question uh, that uh, came in saying there are a lot of people who do not want to get a vaccine. Do you think this will be mandatory to do anything, for example, working or traveling? Um, let me just say that I think that vaccines are the wonder of the world, the marvel of modern medicine. Um, I've lived in places like Pakistan where I've seen what happens when people aren't vaccinated and uh, it's one of my pet peeves when people uh, choose to believe um, you know, scenarios that are, uh, that are fantasy about how uh, vaccines cause, uh, you know, their hair to fall out or, you know, the, the, the moon not to grow full. I just um, think if there is a vaccine, <laughs> that's just my advertisement. Will it become mandatory? I think that's a question for Steve, you know, in, in terms of policy, do you, do you ever see vaccines uh, becoming mandatory? I mean, they are for uh, going to school. Um, you have to take uh, It'd be you know vaccinated against polio and measles, mumps, rubella, and the like. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I uh, I'm not into our uh, tort liability or judiciary mm -hmm. system, but uh, let me just say that it's uh, uh, vaccines to me are an unequivocal public good, meaning that it not only benefits the recipient, but it benefits uh, your neighbor, your community, and society. And uh, I would just like to see it uh, as a voluntary uptake as much as possible. And then it's going to be up to our various uh, jurisdictions and legal systems to dictate whether or not it becomes mandatory. Thanks. Um, I have a question um, for Sachin Shah. Um, I, you know, you might have noticed that I stepped away. That was because my dog, um, who's become totally spoiled during the quarantine and expects my full attention at all times, I had to remove her from whining and, and put her away. Well, I, I understand that um, Sachin's girls are about to knock down the door to his office. And uh, this is such as life in, in the quarantine, but there's someone with a, a burning question for you. So I, I just want to... Uh, so this is a, obviously you've touched the hearts of uh, people listening and the question is the way the healthcare system is handling the safety of all the medical professions is horrifying. How are you and your colleagues coping with the stress of keeping yourself healthy while still showing up for the patients? Just an easy short question before you go attend to your girls. 
we, we've been as a family trying to maintain some routine. My girls are four and two, so if they have no routine. It's just a zoo in the house. And the same goes for us. You know, it's hard. I'm used to getting up at five o'clock every day and now it's getting tougher and tougher to get up at seven o'clock. Um, but we make sure we eat very healthy, very clean diet. We're exercising three to four times a week, just using online programs from YouTube and whatnot. Uh, but to maintain some normalcy for yourself and your family, I think is, is very important, especially during this, these times where everything is just turned upside down. Um, and uh, positive attitude, positive lookout, uh, out, outlook for the future, uh, I think, in, in my opinion, is, is key at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, if you step away, we'll understand. Um, but I do have another question. And um, I think it's probably for, for Marianne. Um, this is someone who says, my partner tested positive for antibodies, but I subsequently tested negative. How can that possibly be since we live together? It's like you're so curious, well, Marianne, why you didn't get a positive. Is there another kind of test I should take to explore this at a deeper level? Uh, I really, I can't speak specifically to the test. I, I myself am consistently amazed um, because I have physically been surrounded by COVID for the last two months. Uh, so I'm with that person. And if there's a better test, I'd love to know what it is. Um, the reality is that, that some people are going to react. Some people aren't going to react. Um, and uh, to the, to getting the illness, I mean, um, I think that eventually when, when the antibody tests are sorted out, they're, they're decent. Antibody tests in general are pretty decent, but, um, but the, the, the randomness of this illness is, is that sometimes people get sick and sometimes people don't. This is one of the rules of illness in general. Sometimes people, uh, you know, we've seen it with, with every infectious disease ever. And that is what both creates fear and anxiety, but also this false sense of security that people can mass together in large groups and protest and, 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 um, and say that, you know, it's not a real illness because it's a, it's, there's a, there is a randomness to who actually gets infected sometimes. Although there are obviously things we can do to prevent being in a space where we're infected and then a space where we're not. Um, how is it that a virus gets a toehold in, in some people and not in another? Is it related to um, the, uh, the, 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 the um, size of the exposure, um, whether they've been next to a very highly viremic person or, you know, is, is it a matter of overwhelming in the system or um, is it just the uh, immune systems of some people um, make them targets for some viruses and other pathogens, but not for others? I mean, clearly, I think some people have immune systems that make them more likely to be infected, but I, I, there's a philosophical aspect to this question, right? I intubated somebody on the 13th of March who coughed right before they intubated right into my face. So not their fault. That's what was wrong with them. But, but I was pretty sure that should have gotten me and it didn't. Now, that also gives us this like false sense of security when things like that happen, that you're not going to get infected. Back to what Dr. Shaw was saying about, uh, you know, they're really, really compliant about wearing the masks right now. And if somebody gives them a test that says that they might have some immunity because they have some antibodies, you know, will they become less compliant with the mask? Wearing those masks is a real pain in the neck. It just is. Mm -hmm. and, and it's inconvenient and it's uncomfortable and it impacts how we can communicate with each other and with patients. So it'd be great to give them up. So there's going to be a lot of things leading towards we would like to have a life without these limitations. But, you know, is that a reasonable option at this point? And I would, I would vote right now. It's not a reasonable option. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we've been, uh, we've been uh, talking for an hour. The time has, has flown by, almost an hour. And I have one more question um, because, um, I mean, here we all are on the screen and some of us have worked in decades in health. And then there's a, a Macaulay student who's held her own and, you know, and the conversation is actively engaged. And um, it's been a terrible semester for our students, you know, suddenly everything going online. And I just like uh, uh, Tanya for you to reflect on how you've been managing as a student during this time. Um, 
It was definitely a shock. I'm also a um, resident assistant at the Towers at the City College of New York. And, you know, we received a three day notice to pack our things and move out because the governor um, was handing our building over to the National Guard. Um, so it was very difficult, I think, to just have um, at one time, just like you have to say goodbye to your home and your uh, college and all the events that we've been putting on um, and then not really being goodbye because of social distancing that's been in place. It was very difficult. Um, but thankfully, um, I think that there's been a lot of resources coming in both from City College and Macaulay um, supporting all the students and making sure that we're doing okay, like with the, either with the constant emails um, or even the um, events that you virtual events with the therapy. Um, group therapy, group yoga, I, we all really appreciate that and we see that coming in. I know as a um, resident assistant, I'm very thankful also is that we, I wasn't just fired, I was put as a remote RA and mm -hmm. I also put on a couple of virtual events um, trying to cheer up my re own residents um, with like uh, just tutorials on like how to make bread at home and stuff like that. I think it's really important to just try to keep in touch with your loved ones. And I think that the college has really um, tried to um, put a support system in place with, for the students. And yeah. Well, we put these support systems in place, but they only work if we have students who are resilient. And, um, and, and that sort of intelligence and resilience uh, just uh, shines uh, from you, Tanya, and for, from uh, most of our students. So it's, um, you know, it's been a, um, it's been very touching uh, to me to see how uh, we all have remained a loving community of scholars despite this, uh, this frightening time. Um, I wanna thank the panelists um, and ask if there are any parting words, any um, message you have for this community that uh, has come together to learn more about the, uh, the struggle against uh, coronavirus uh, to keep in mind going forward. Any last words around the, the squares here? Well, there being none, I think everyone's talked out. And I just want to, again, uh, express my appreciation. I think it's, um, you know, we're, we're learning a lot of fun things that we can do, or maybe not fun is the word, but interesting uh, subjects we can explore in depth by tapping on the broad expertise of our community, whether students, parents, board members, alumni. Um, thank you all for participating. And thanks for everybody. Um, for uh, tuning in. Um, thanks a lot. And um, I guess we'll all say, say farewell now. Thank you, Mary. Thank, Thank you very much. much.